Hi, and welcome to a panel recorded for EGX Digital 2020. My name is Sachin, and thanks for joining us. We're talking today about horror games and anxiety, and we're really looking forward to talking about it because we are all part of Gaming the Mind, which is a group of mental health professionals who are interested in the interplay between video games and mental health. I, Sachin, am a mental health doctor or psychiatrist, and I'm joined today by my colleagues in Gaming the Mind, Don, who is also a psychiatrist, and Hammy, a doctor working in London, and together we're very excited to bring this topic to you, so thanks for joining us. Hammy, I wanted to start with you just to ground us in what horror exactly is. Well... I think if you look at horror and the origins of horror, really it's it's one of the oldest forms of fiction that probably even predates written fiction and, and written text in that historically you would have cautionary tales being told often by, say, elders to children to try and discourage them from doing dangerous things, approaching the river. Um, and what better way is there to... Um, scare people by creating, taking real dangers, the danger of drowning and slipping, and instead personifying it, making it into a monster or a demon, such as a, a water spirit or in traditional Japanese mythology, the, the kappa. Um, horror has been with us, uh, for a very, very long time. Um, and now is a, a major genre of fiction with horror movies, horror video games, horror books, and even horror VR experiences now being incredibly popular. Um, and this is all despite the fact that one would think perhaps horror would be, uh, or being frightened is, is a negative experience for people. You'd think people would want to avoid that. But of course, there are many people like um, myself, Don, um, and many others who actually really quite enjoy these experiences. You say that um, horror has uh, got a long historic roots in cautionary tales. Would the grim fairy tales be an example of that? Oh, absolutely. If you look at the original versions of most fairy tales, they are incredibly, well, grim, um, with um, bad endings and, and, and terrible outcomes, um, almost designed to um, warn kids, you know, don't go off the beaten, half when, uh, beaten path when you're on your way home, um, like with the um, original Little Red Riding Hood. Um, but also, um, horror itself um, has roots in, in mythology, um, with even the, the classic Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is a classic piece of horror fiction, itself mirroring uh, certain aspects of Greek mythology. Um, it's, it's, um, and it kind of taps into a very uh, primal reaction and response. You know, if you watch a, a comedy film, um, there's so much involved um, syntax and language in what makes a joke funny or not. But, and mm. whilst there is, you know, comedy that has no words, uh, so you can look at, you know, Mr. Bean, for example, almost all horror can operate without a, an understanding of language. It's a, a very, mm. it's a, a primal response and language that is hard coded into all of us. Um, yeah. And it's, it's very difficult to, to control that reaction. Um, hence, well, that's probably a part of why it's, it's so successful. And so I've got a question. Yeah. Because uh, you mentioned that a lot of horror media is about cautionary tales. I think it would be interesting when we think about computer games and horror, because, you know, you, when you see a film and they say, oh, no, you, you shouldn't go into that place, it's, gonna, it's a really bad idea, or you shouldn't all split up. How, you know, you think about computer games and the difference is that you can actually be in, in charge so it's interesting. It might be interesting to think about how do video games get around that or, or not, um, because this is a medium where surely you won't make the or you shouldn't choose to make the bad decision. But in games, if they want the horror element, they still have to make you do the bad decision or the thing that will be horrifying. Mm. It's almost like there's a um, would you say a dissonance between your knowledge of, of what should be avoided but knowing that you have to go ahead with it anyway in order to progress the, the story. Well, a lot of games railroad you. Um, we'll, but that's we'll, not as close sure we'll horror games, about... is it? Ludo narrative no. <laughs> I I'm not going to dare use that word. Um, 
Uh, but, you know, if you think about, have you guys played, you've played Half-Life Alex, isn't it, Ham? Oh, yes, yeah. And uh, there, 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 is, there is, it's not a horror, it's not a horror game, uh, but the Half-Life series has always had um, uh, horror influences um, throughout it. Um, but I think it's particularly explicit. Uh, one chapter in Half-Life Alex, isn't it? With, uh, I think I think it's called Jeff, isn't yes, it? Yes, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and it just occurred to me that the way it got around it is the way I think it, Half-Life games in general are quite sort of um, very much, uh, you know, got a strong structured um, direction. So, for example, in Jeff, there is a bit where um, the, you know, basically there's this horrible baddie, Jeff, who uh, cannot be killed and you have to sneak around him. He's, he's blind, um, but has the hearing of Mozart, you're told right at the start of the level. So you have to kind of quietly sneak around the place. And they basically just engineer multiple situations where you're forced to go near him for a, con for, for a contrivance. Like there's a bit where you get have to get into a lift and then he walks into the lift and you have to push a button that's right next to Jeff. Um, so they, 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 they kind of force you to, to have to go near him. Um, which I suppose is similar to how in the film, you know, the horror film, be a bit where they say, no, you shouldn't go into the house or, you know, you shouldn't split up. But they're like, no, we're going to make you split up. We're going to make you go right next to the thing that clearly you should get as far away from as possible at all times. And, and I think that um, reminds me of older horror games like Clock Tower, the original Clock Tower, mm. where if you actually take options and routes to try and escape, so if you see a, a, an empty car in, in the garage and try to get in to escape, you actually get a bad ending and, and are killed. And in fact, you're rewarded for uh, delving deeper into the house and trying to uncover the mysteries rather than attempting to escape. Yeah. And I think there, there was a, there was a lovely little guy who does YouTube or is it, you know, he does little shorts um, of humorous things. I've forgotten his name. Oh no, the Tom uh, Murray. Uh, but you know, you know, uh, <laughs> there's that whole, I think it's a, a common kind of a uh, bit of computer game logic where in an RPG, if there's a correct way to go, you will always go the wrong way first. Um, so, you know, you'll go through all the side passages first because there'll invariably be something there. So there's mm. not just horror games, but in general, you know, we have this, it's almost this perversity that if you're told you have to go to building A, you'll go to buildings B, C, and D first. You kind of can't um, help but try to satiate that curiosity. Yes. Um, and, and you were mentioning about, you know, horror has been around a very long time. I think horror in computer games has been around as long as computer games have been around, uh, even when uh, the power, you know, they weren't able to do anything too impressive. I think, you know... Well, Don, you're on that topic. Why don't you tell me about the um, history of horror in video games? Yeah, so the the, the earliest one, you know, that, I, that uh, I was thinking of is called Haunted House on the Atari uh, 2600 in 1982. Um, where you are literally just a very basic uh, pair of eyes on a sphere. Um, uh, but, you know, a and another that came to mind is one called Sweet Home that's an RPG and yet is horror on the PC in 1989. But then you sort of see, I think the one that we see and we think, yes, this is survival horror is uh, Alone in the Dark uh, on the PC, which is in 1992. And when you see that, uh, it's... Uh, you, know, you can see a lot of other games coming from it because it's got a uh, you know, basic free, a 3D main character of this detective in a, in a haunted house um, on 2D backgrounds with fixed sort of camera angles. Uh, and you see that and you can sort of see it as the progenitor going towards, you know, Resident Evil, which we then had the PS1 in 1996. Um, and I suppose that's what we would, what I would think of as the golden era of survival horror where it's this wonderful, um, you, know, you know, necessity is the mother of invention and the PS1, because of the hardware and what it was, is that, that you, know, to, you know, having 2D backgrounds and 3D characters is a wonderful trick to get the maximum out of the, the system. And, and it suited, you know, survival horror so well. Uh, and then you had, you know, lots of following on games in the Resident Evil series. You had Dino Crisis, um, 
I don't know, did you play any of those games, Ham? Oh, absolutely. I mean, everything you were saying about necessity being the mother of invention holds true for the Silent Hill series. If yeah. you look at that game, it's you're in a town that's completely shrouded by fog. When you're outside, you're lucky if you can see more than two meters in front of, in front of you. And apparently the actual reason why that was done was because of limitations in terms of, you know, rendering distance. Uh, and one of the more, town. yeah, and one of the more recent versions of Silent Hill 2, um, my understanding is that they actually, you know what I'm going to say, isn't it? Yeah. That, that yeah. they actually, um, uh, you know, you know, they did away with some of the amazing fog is my understanding. Um, and you know, it wasn't, you know, the recommendations are if you want to play Silent Hill 2, if you can get get yourself a PS2 and play it on that, that's probably, you know, a better experience. Well, can I ask a question mm. on this? So we're going to get on to the mechanisms of fear in horror games, but just on that topic, can you just tell me, is Silent Hill 2 less scary without the fog? Oh, God, uh, yeah. I would certainly say so. And when I say less scary... Um, I think it's important to draw a d distinction between the concept of terror and horror. So in classic Gothic fic uh, fiction, um, terror is the foreboding sense of dread that builds up before you are frightened uh, and can be created with atmosphere. And I think the original Silent Hill 2 has a, you know, in, in spades. Um, whereas horror uh, was defined as the revulsion and repulsion that you experience um, when you are finally do encounter that thing which is frightening. Um, so, say when you have an enemy face to face and the atmosphere j just is, is not the same when you can see the entire town at a great distance sure maybe you can see some far off enemies that might make you feel uncomfortable but as HP Lovecraft once said love is fiction, I don't love the man was, you know, had terrible views but he did say um, fear is um, if I'm getting this right the most primal or one of the most primal of all emotions and it is especially the fear of un of the unknown mm. that is the, the 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 strongest and the most gripping absolutely uh, and i think you look at you know the history of, of computer of horror computer games and you can see that through it like a stick of rock you know you look at um you know silent hill on the ps1 then silent hill 2 with the fog um and you look at games like fear have you played fear Oh, yeah. PC. So to explain, that's an FPS. So it's a first person shooter and it actually has very impressive uh, mechanics on, on the action sort of side of things. And yet it is still most definitely um, a horror game. Um, and it has, you know, these very uh, dark, um, foreboding, claustrophobic environments through most of its runtime. Then you think of something like uh, Amnesia uh, in 2010 on the PC. Again, um, lots of little things, you know, technology has moved on and there are more nuanced ways that you can play with, with, the, with, the, with the viewer, with the person who's playing the game. Uh, for example, uh, the way that you open and shut doors in Amnesia. You know, before then, you would press the button, the door opens, the door closes. In this, you actually have to do it by graduation, isn't it, of, of the mouse. So you do subtle movements back and forward. So you're actually in more control over, do I want to open this door fully? You know, do I want to open it slowly? And I suppose that's similar to when you think of virtual reality in 2020 with Half-Life Alex of, you know, you actually have to, you know, take the handle and open it, you know, and you choose the speed, you choose when it happens, um, which I suppose is quite different. You think about Resident Evil and it had those very, you know, quite iconic sort of moments where, you know, you open the door and it's actually to hide a loading screen. Um, and I suppose those actually are, those actually release a bit of tension because you know for the next two or three seconds, uh, you know, you're probably, nothing is going to happen. Although they did subvert that. Um, which one was it? They subverted it in one of the games where you open a door, but then a zombie actually does come through during this loading sequence. Do you remember this? You so actually open the, the door um, hmm. and, it, and then a zombie actually appears when you think it's meant to be a loading sequence. So you can have fun subverting when you think you're actually protected. Did they do that in one of the more recent Resident Evils where, you know, they have safe rooms but there is a safe room in the Resident Evil remake, Resident Evil 2 remake, where actually not all the safe rooms are entirely safe and you can get attacked in a uh, typewriter room. Is that um, Mr. X? Yeah. Yeah, who pursues you endlessly. Um, yeah, I think it might be the central police station typewriter room 
That's correct. Even wondering. But yeah, that, that did catch me uh, <laughs> by surprise, especially when I paused it, saved it, and reloaded it, expecting him to be despawned, <laughs> but he was actually still there. It, was uh, he like, still there, there with his arms crossed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what time do you call this? <laughs> but it's interesting, Don, that you talk about games um, monitoring your performance and then adapting the situation according to that. Because uh, no, no names immediately jump out to me from memory, but I am aware that there were games um, developed or at least um, being worked on that attempted to um, include the use of a heart rate monitor in order to, to track your heart rate as you play uh, the game and change the situation um, or the, the, the encounters that you have depending on your heart rate and how fast your heart is beating or uh, almost in a way encouraging you to, to try and, and calm yourself um, or uh, make attempts to do so. Normally they're not horror games, though. normally they're, they're trying to soothe you, isn't it? Those sorts yes. of games <laughs> rather than like, how can we, how can we ramp it up a bit? And it, you're talking about how there are different types of horror. Maybe one thing I could mention that gives gives makes a point to this. Yeah, you know, we talk about different types. Is that there was an excellent horror game in 2015 called Soma, which I absolutely adored. Uh, and when I went into it, I was advised by a friend that there are two ways of playing the game: the normal way, uh, where essentially it's a bit like amnesia. There are these horrible monsters that chase you around, um, and this is all set. It, you know, you're un under the sea and it's very claustrophobic but there is a mode where actually the enemies can't hurt you um and you can't die and it's more just the story and i was recommended to to play the version where um you know the, the ai is turned off and essentially it's more just a narrative experience but that doesn't actually stop it from from being horrific mm. have you played soma ham Yes, I, I think I picked it up when it was free on PS Plus a while ago. What would um, you say apart from, without spoiling it, because it's all about existentialism, I suppose, isn't it? Mm. No, I, I think definitely, and perhaps it's something we can get onto a bit later, but for people who are looking, or I, because I get friends all the time who ask me and say, oh, the story of these horror games sounds really interesting, I'd love to play a horror game, but it's just too much for me. And I'd say Soma, um, especially in the mode that Turns off the enemy AI is a great stepping stone in a way into um, horror games and horror fiction. Um, there's there's nothing wrong. It's, it's not um, a lesser way of enjoying it. It's just a, an alternative way of focus on a narrative. And who knows? Maybe um, once you finish that game with the uh, enemy AI turned off, you can you, you'll feel more strengthened and more able to to come back to it or other similar games. Um, and, and give them a go as well. I think it's a, it's a gradually, it's important to ease your way in and kind of not jump in at the deep end. Otherwise, you, you'll have a terrible time and never want to try it again or any horror fiction again. And I think you mentioned one of the reasons people go into horror there is that it can be empowering. When, oh, yeah. When you can uh, oh, make it through. So, oh, I think, speaking of mm, reasons that people go into horror games, uh, and I'm glad I have you both here to sort of teach me about this because I am a big scaredy cat and I don't like uh, playing horror games and I wonder why people do because they elicit fear response and that's an unpleasant emotion, right? So what, mm. and I'm sure, you know, I'm, I'm not alone that not everyone seeks out this kind of thing. So why is it that people play horror games? Don? So, so we mentioned, you know, in this example that it can be empowering, uh, that you find something difficult you, you triumph, uh, and then you look back in it and you feel that you've grown a little bit. Um, I suppose we also think about, um, you know, not this is not just exclusive to horror, uh, but in computer games in general, they can be exhilarating, like like a roller coaster. Um, so it's just, it, it's another way of getting that, that, that high of, you know, that real intense sort of experience. Um, uh, and I, I suppose, there's also this idea of, I, I suppose when I think about the Resident Evil games, for me, um, I didn't, I don't, I didn't play things like Resident Evil because I, I wanted to be scared. I played them because I found the environments really exciting and interesting. And I wanted to see what was next, and it was just a really good, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, kind of a good, a good model, a good sort of um, 
a good a good way to to deliver that that experience of of of, of discovering something new something different you know horror is a great genre for that i don't know what, what you would think hamilton well i remember there was this fantastic tedx panel talk um or just tedx talk by a, a researcher of horror uh, as, as a medium um researcher by the name of matthias klassen who kind of broke it down into um, two main reasons but he spoke about how whenever we're exposed to something terrifying you know that sets off um the, the amygdala in our brain which is responsible for identifying um threats and trying to begin or start to mount a, a physical response to it and it's almost as if every time someone watches a horror film or plays a horror game it's almost like you're taking your ancient inbuilt um evolutionary response to threatening stimuli which originally would have been a predator say a saber tooth tiger and you're giving it a test run mm. uh, because the fact of the matter is in day-to-day -day society well unless you're incredibly unfortunate you won't encounter um immediate threats to your life sure you're you're, you're I'm sure many people are bombarded by smaller, smaller threats throughout the day. Um, but nothing along the lines of, of something that generally makes you fear for your life or incredibly uncomfortable. And so there is value in, in a controlled, measured environment being able to, to almost practice that. And it's, it's like the, the concept of play, you know, kids mm. uh, and, and people through play practice aggression towards each other, uh, play fighting. Um, experiencing horror is, is almost another form of play like play practice um fear response to the threatening stimuli um so there's that aspect but also uh, um he, he went on to talk about how there's research to suggest that people who um regularly uh consume horror fiction watch horror films over time they find themselves um becoming um less or, or less sensitive to horror responses almost as if to be to feel as frightened they have to watch something that's that's, that's scarier and almost pushing that threshold almost like a, a personal uh, training or, or pushing past your limits yeah and then there's also additional research to suggest that people who regularly um c watch horror films feel that in some way it gives them a, a sense of mastery over other aspects of their life um i can't recall the, the specifics that were mentioned um but I can see how, you know, personally, anecdotally, uh, through playing horror games and having those encounters, it makes me feel um, a bit less unsettled when, say, I have to work in the hospital at night and, and the corridors are empty. I'm, I'm able to just push that to the back of my mind and, and keep walking without thinking too much about don't, it. Don't think too much about Silent Hill 2. <laughs> yes. <laughs> do you think that people who do experience issues such as anxiety, for example play horror games to get a sense of comfort so there was that one vice article wasn't there about um people with anxiety um who have self-reported as, as enjoying horror video games and other horror media and they were kind of wondering why that me that might be the case and and why um because you'd think why would um individuals who struggle with uh, anxiety on a daily basis why would they want to expose themselves to um tense um though not real very tense situations for media that may evoke uh, feelings of anxiety and i think it did come back to the concept of it being quite a, a controlled environment you know that you can mm. pause the film pause the game walk away from the screen uh, at any moment and in addition, with games at the very least, you do feel um, like you are uh, conquering something. It's w whilst not every um, horror game will have a happy ending. The fact of the matter is, you are proceeding, you are progressing, um, and it you are, it is um, a, a threat you you are able to to, to take on, um, and in some ways, perhaps it's healthier and better. Um, or some people feel that for themselves personally, it's, it's better to be able to take on those kind of situations in a safe space at home so that it makes other things in, during day to day life seem more trivial in comparison to say the time they were being chased, 
um, by a, by a head group. Well, <laughs> or, or, or uh, anything really. Um, I guess that mental comparison is um, um, can help some people. Yeah, and I, I think I, I like the idea of you talk. You talked about strengthening a muscle, uh, the way you might you know strengthen a physical muscle. Because I think there is this idea of ego depletion, of uh, that we we do have you know that there is this idea of whilst we can't give a specific number we you know we, we do have reserves uh, in terms of what 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 you know can stress us out uh, and there's this idea that it can get depleted um and uh, if you take too many knocks you will go down but if you take something that is tolerable um just as with you know physically exercising it can in, in, you know, improve what you can manage um I was interested in this, you know, sense of fear that um, horror gives us. Uh, just from a biological perspective, could you explain to me, Hami, like what is happening to us when we experience fear? Sure. So, without getting into any unnecessary complexities, it's it's, it's very simple, really. We experience a, um, a, a, or we interpret something as being threatening. And that immediately kicks off in, in, for our brain and our body, a flight or fight response where you get increased activity of the sympathetic nervous system. That is everything that prepares us for action. So what you'll have is your heart will start beating faster because you need to get blood, um, um, pumping to, to the muscles in your body. Um, so that if necessary, you can run away or you can engage in a fight. Um, you also get your hair standing on end in a process called uh, pillow erection, which um, these days um, doesn't do as much, but historically our ancestors would have had a lot more hair on their bodies. So having your hair stand on end, much like when it happens to a cat, makes you seem bigger and more intimidating and, and threatening to whatever um, uh, aggressor is coming towards you. And um, you have also um, decreased peristalsis activity of uh, your digestive system, um, and y your mouth can feel dry. Um, and it's all of these kind of sensations that together with, you know, s sweaty palms that one can get when, um, one is feeling anxious, you know, waiting for a bus, knowing that you're going to be late for work and God knows what your boss is going to say. Um, but tr traditionally, um, those or, or, or historically, all of those things would have been useful for us. And now mm. they just sometimes can really get in the way and create these very unpleasant experiences, especially for people uh, who suffer from uh, anxiety disorders. Um, it, it can be quite debilitating, um, unfortunately. Mm. So I suppose it could almost be described as like an adrenaline rush? Exactly. That's a, yes, adrenaline is certainly involved in, in the sympathetic response. Uh, that's exactly what it is, actually, yeah. I mean, Don, uh, Hammy mentioned the uh, flight or fight response. Why do we have such a response? Because, yeah, I mean, there's nothing really to run away from, right? Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. Um, nowadays, however, uh, you know, when you think about evolution, you think about it in terms of obviously you think in terms of millions of years, or you think in terms of much, much longer periods of time. So in a way, our brains are still very much um behaving uh you know for for a different for a different world that doesn't possibly doesn't exist f for the vast majority of us um where it would have evolutionally been been an advantage um um you know uh what there's one book which made a real influence on me called the gift of fear by a guy called uh, Gavin De Becker, I believe, uh, and, and this was a, a really interesting book where it talked about um, fear being a gift. It talked about being, you know, uh, something that we actually do need, uh, and it keeps us safe. Uh, and that listening to fear or acknowledging fear um, can uh, keep you safe and help you um, react to situations. Um, but yes, I, I think fear, fear is an important thing, but it, it's evolved for, for a whole different world. Uh, and that's something that I suppose, uh, for those where it goes, you know, where they have difficulties because of 
your anxiety or phobias or these sorts of things. Um, I suppose one of the most common models of the way we think about it is um, a, a therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and one of the models uh, that we think about uh, in this, uh, which is probably helpful for thinking about how 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 we're affected is what's called uh, it's called a hot, hot cross bun, and if I could draw, I would draw a little uh, square with, where where you have uh, physiology, uh, so you know your heart racing, um, your your hairs standing on end, your butterflies in your stomach, all that that sort of thing, all the, all the physi physiological things that you experience. You, you then think about uh, your thoughts, your you know so your cognitions of you know, for example, if if it's say, you know, it's late at night, you know, th th thinking about what what is in in what is what is what can you not see that you're thinking about that's you know possibly very scary. You think about uh, your your feelings, your moods, um, and how those can be influenced by those thoughts or by by the physiology, um, and you think about your behaviours, so the things that you do. And CBT is all about learning to better understand how all four of those things can it can influence can influence all of them in any direction um i'll give you i'll give you a perfect example with myself so sometimes i like to drink coffee uh, and sometimes if i drink uh, one too many in the morning i will suddenly wonder why am i feeling really anxious and then i'll check my pulse and i'll realize no it, it's I've, I've literally drunk enough coffee that i've you know given myself a bit of a tachycardia um and that has you know, then led me to think, you know, that I must be scared of something when actually it's the other way around. I don't know if Hamilton, if you could give any other examples of those sorts of things. I could give an example of our computer game. We could talk about Alien Isolation. Do you guys, Hamilton, could you explain, have you played I Alien Isolation? Oh, yes, I have. Um, tell tell uh, us about Alien Isolation. Well, in Alien Isolation, um, much like in the alien films, um, there is a looming threat of, well, an alien. Um, but in um, this game in particular, they really hit the nail on the head with the experience of feeling incredibly trapped and alone and also facing a very intelligent predator that changes its behavior uh, yeah. constantly in order to fr fr throw you off, almost as if it's, it's playing with you. Um, or it's being directed by somebody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but that game certainly got my heart racing, um, both in, in the final release. But I remember years ago playing at EGX back when they had a, a VR build, which unfortunately didn't make it to, oh, to the final game. But yes, that was <laughs> quite the, the heart racing experience. Good Lord. I, I don't think I could handle a virtual reality of, of Alien Isolation. So that, that, that would be too much. Yeah. So if, I guess if we think about the CBT sort of model of thinking mm -hmm. about things um it, it could be that uh you you know you you're, you're playing through an area and it's deliberately very dark and maybe you can't see around the corners you know that there is a looming threat so that could be the thought um and then there might be behaviors so you 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 you, you maybe run um in, in a certain direction because you want to get away from the alien uh, but perhaps that makes things worse. You then might have you know, uh, your mood might then become very sort of anxious or tense, thinking, oh, you know, and then there'll be thoughts, you know, oh, gosh, this, this alien is going to get me. Uh, and there may well be physiology from that of um, you start to sweat, you start your heart rate climbs, um, you start to get, you know, um, nausea, uh, so, you know, you could think about it in those ways of all, all those areas can affect each other. Uh, and I suppose for those um, that have difficulties with phobias or anxiety or, uh, you know, uh, conditions like that, um, they, they, it's, it's all a process of, of, of learning what is your difficulty and going through experiments or homework uh, to try and find out what might, uh, you know, cut the chain between any of these four things. Um, you know, might cut any of those links between any of those four things. Hemi, could you tell me then, because we've thought about ways that horror games can affect us, you've told me about the physiology of it, and Don, you've mentioned that physiology is just one part of it alongside thoughts and uh, actions and feelings. 
I mean, how could someone who is experiencing anxiety because of horror games deal with that? Like, uh, say I want to get into horror games and I'm just feeling too nervous and uh, too anxious about it. What can I do? So, there's, there's a, number of, a number of things I'll suggest, but the very first thing I'll suggest is the same thing that people actually do with horror films, and that's make it a social experience. If you have a, a bunch of friends over uh, on the couch um, the first time you play this, this new horror game, it can be quite um, a positive experience. You, you share in the fear, and if it ever gets too overwhelming for one person, you can always hand over the controller, um, watch while someone else takes a turn. And the good thing about doing this is it makes it all a bit more lighthearted. It, it's hard to feel as, 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 um, as, as frightened, actually, when you have company. And you can also um, see, see the comedy of it when something does go wrong and you have to pass on the controller. Um, if you don't have that option available, a good alternative, um, and one that has been very successful for many individuals on YouTube, is watching Let's Plays. Um, in fact, I'll dare say that the, the most successful Let's Players on YouTube right now um, started out as horror YouTubers. They, they mainly played horror games. games is, is, that, this, is this Five Nights at Freddy's or Slender Man? What, what, what yeah, do you think was the... Th th those kind of games, Amnesia, The Dark Descent, um, yeah. a lot of RPG Maker games, it, Mad Father, Yume Nikki, um, Our Oni um, as well. And it, it, it makes it a lot more accessible because you aren't in control. So if something goes wrong, it doesn't feel like it's, it's a consequence of, of what something you've done wrong. Rather, you can take a backseat and watch someone else. And often these let's players will make it comedic. They'll, they'll make it quite comical, which lessens the blur of some of the, the more, the more frightening moments. And as you gradually start to experience horror games more with friends and also with let's players, um, socially and parasocially, um, it will hopefully instill in yourself um, some more confidence and, and willingness to, to try it out yourself. And when you try it out yourself, you don't need to necessarily jump right in and play it in the middle of the night with all the, the blinds drawn and, and completely by yourself. You know, you can start out, try playing during the day with the windows open, maybe take breaks every 15, 30 minutes, talk to someone on the phone. Um, if things do get too intense, pause it, take a walk. It's You're, you're very much in control and it's yes. all about um, having the experience that you find most satisfying. And don't let anyone tell you there's a, there's a wrong way to experience it because everybody has to start somewhere, right? And I know that um, even though I watched my father play Resident Evil growing up, the first <laughs> game, I didn't dive right into playing horror games. Uh, the first game with any horror elements that I played was Luigi's Mansion on the GameCube. That was <laughs> the first one I was able to complete by myself. And actually, the, the confidence I gained through that experience, which, you know, looking back seems childish, but at the time was a bit creepy, um, empowered me to, to try further games. And, and well, now I'm very much looking forward to, to Resident Evil 8. And if, if they do release it on VR, I'll definitely be giving that a go. Um, no. Can't wait, to be uh, honest. Um, when, I, when I think of you and I think of horror, and you mention you know, com putting in comedy elements, do you know what I think of? I think of a certain game, uh, Deadly Premonition from 2010, because <laughs> I know that you love that game. And that is, it, I've not actually played it, but I'm aware it is, um, it is a game where it is horror, but is also humorous. Is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, it's Deadly sort of a Premonition. gateway drug. It's a masterpiece, actually. Uh, and <laughs> is, it, I, is it though? <laughs> well, it, it's certainly art. I don't think that can be a, <laughs> you can't argue with that. Um, but yeah, exactly. Experiences like Deadly Premonition, where there are equal moments that are equally terrifying and hilarious, where it's mm. not constant oppressiveness. Uh, um, say, a la Silent Hill, which is well, fantastic. I'd highly recommend the Silent Hill series, but maybe not for, for um, newcomers or first timers. Um, something like Deadly Premonition, which has breaks between horror, comedy, and, and uh, narrative elements, is, is a, a great way in to those kind of games are uh, uh, highly recommended. But if you do play on Steam, be aware the PC version has many bugs, including one where the game crashes if you don't smoke at least once every 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so uh, I mean, that's uh, some excellent practical tips. And 
I think one more tip I wanted from you, if you know of it, is say someone legit- legitimately has a difficulty with jump scares in horror games. Um, and that can be for uh, various reasons, but including having mental health conditions such as PTSD or anxiety disorders, where you're, sometimes people with those conditions can have... Um, uh, exaggerated startle responses and can be triggered into uh, um, uh, negative mood states and mental states. And so a horror game just might not be right for them. What can they do? Well, Sachin, I'm really glad you asked that question because these days there are a lot more options of, of what, what you can do to avoid, um, especially with jump scares, those immediately overwhelming stimuli. So these days, most games will allow you to control the volume, not just of background music, but sound effects as well. And it can be, if, if you do find yourself getting startled by immediate jumps, sometimes it can be good to, to, to play the sound settings, um, turn down those kind of louder sound effects like screams and whatnot, so that so they're less in your face. There's also some good lists um, that are being well curated, I think, on Twitter and Reddit, of mm. horror games that are free from jump scares and recommended for individuals who... Um, for no fault of their own, uh, find it difficult to, to experience these kind of games. So I definitely recommend having a, you know, a, a quick look on, on Reddit and Twitter for said lists, uh, cause they are out there and, and uh, fairly up to date. Um, in addition, um, I think something that's more rare, but I, <laughs> I can't recall, but I think there may be at least, uh, one or two indie games out there, um, which allow you all together to, to turn off jump scares. Um, I wish a name came to mind. Um, but it'd be nice if that became more common practice overall, um, because we, we are seeing increasing accessibility, for example, you know, in the latest Insomniac game, Spider-Man game, um, where, um, turning off the need to pass quick time events with rapid button presses for individuals who simply are una- unable to do that. Um, increasing accessibility, um, I think is, is never a bad thing. Um, and I'd, I would like to see it done, um, more and done tactfully with horror games. Um, You mentioned accessibility, and this brings to mind the game Grounded. Um, Could you tell me about the accessibility settings in Grounded? Because I think those are really positive for people who have a very specific form of anxiety. So Grounded is um, uh, a game that's taken an absolutely brilliant approach to arachnophobia. And what they've done is uh, because in the game, uh, from what I understand, you, you are very small and therefore any um, creatures, any bugs that you encounter are, are quite large and, and intimidating. Um, naturally, if you have a, a fear of spiders, that can be very overwhelming and very unpleasant. And what they've done, which I absolutely love, is they have a slider in the settings where you can change how much the spiders look like spiders. And That's genius. You know, it, it really is. Uh, and just... The, the fact that you can turn it down a bit so the legs are less hairy instead of having, you know, like many eyes, they just have two, um, change it so that instead of having eight legs, that they just have, you know, like four or two. And it, it gets simpler and simpler where, you know, they don't have like a, a creepy mouth, but it, oh, and to the point where in the, in the final setting, they're basically just blobs, like little, uh, non threatening, uh, looking blobs. Um, they just want to hug you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they look like marshmallows. Um, and, <laughs> It's great that they take a graded approach because that gives control to the player. Not everyone who has arachnophobia has the same level of repulsion. And some people uh, may, in fact, be trying to, through gradual graded exposure, increase their um, their ability to tolerate this uh, unpleasant uh, stimulus. And so by giving players the power and putting it in, in their hands where they can start off with spiders that look like marshmallows and say, you know what, maybe I'll turn back on, you know, the eyes and maybe like I'll, I'll, I'll gradually make them look a bit more like spiders. You're empowering people to get over and overcome their, their long held uh, fears and phobias. So it, it sounds like Hamilton that this game is clearly, you know, been made by people who've got, who've got some understanding of, you know, exposure therapy, this idea of, um, uh, exposure and response prevention um you know as you say in this game this idea of 
uh, you know, with 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 fear. I suppose that that I wish I could draw because I would draw a little diagram of what happens where uh, if you imagine time on one axis and the intensity of what you're experiencing on the other in terms of fear. Um, when someone has a stimulus that you know that is very fearful, like a spider, um, people imagine that what's going to happen is that the, the fear is going to go up and up and up and up and up until it's going to be utterly insurmountable. Um, whereas the the reality of the thing um, is actually is that it will plateau. So the reality is that it won't go in a straight line up. It will eventually settle down and plateau, and then it will will go down. So you know the, the sort of mainstay of therapy with you know, phobias um, is uh, giving something something that's not so big a stimulus that's intolerable that you can you know, sit with it um, to basically teach your body that actually it will settle down uh, and then you go for something slight, slightly worse. Um, so it sounds like this game is very much influenced by you know, um, this, this, this idea of exposure therapy. Yeah, it almost does sound like. I suppose if you, if you if you if you went straight, so if you were to go straight to, um, I've not seen this game, but I imagine if you went straight to the spiders, that would be flooding, which which is uh, the idea of going going for both, you know, you know, full full bore, um, which is not advised, I should add, uh, but that would be what that would be. I, I think. Um... I mean, I doubt that the game is designed for that, but it does no. remind me <laughs> of um, certain uh, interventions that they are running in uh, select centers, uh, particularly research centers, where they use VR for graded therapy, um, graded exposure therapy, where if you're afraid of a particular thing, that they can use VR to expose you to a mild version of that thing and teach you like brain training, uh, to be able to cope with that uh, in terms of experiencing that anxiety, realizing that you have survived the anxiety and managing it with breathing exercises and whatnot, and then gradually increasing the intensity of that scary stimulus. Um, and you're able to deal with more and more as you go along. So it certainly reminds me of that. Um, I'm sure Grounded wasn't designed in that way, but you know, you can see the similarities for sure. Um, mm, absolutely. Yeah. And um, I if I may, um, it reminds me a lot of the work being done b right now by the, the Oxford uh, University VR group, where they've done this fantastic um, intervention and they've actually um, published uh, some results from it, um, where they use VR in order to create an experience for people with fear of heights, vertigo. And in this experience, you're in a department store. And what you can do is you gradually, you know, go up level by level. So you, you start on the ground floor, go up to the first floor and you're given tasks, um, positive um, tasks, such as reaching out um, over the kind of balcony to, to grab a balloon for a child who's lost their balloon. Or at the very end, going up a, a fireman's lift to try and rescue a cat that's gotten stuck high up. And by, as you say, Sachin, having a gradual, slowly ramping up in, in the um, intensity, um, it, it, it can really uh, quite help. And also by having it associated with a positive task of trying to help someone, um, from what I understand, that helps a lot. And what, what, they've, um, what they found with that was that actually it did significantly help people um, compared to the, the control group um, in terms of their, their perception of um, how... Uh, tall heights really were and the associated uh, fear with that. Uh, and it, it just seems like a really promising area, to be honest. Um, I, I can't wait to see what kind of things we, we see in the future with VR in terms of uh, graded exposure yeah. therapy. Well, I mean, I, it I certainly that... is a promising area in theory. <laughs> and uh, what we would say is, you know, throughout this talk, we've given ideas of how to deal with anxiety, um, you know, mild anxiety with related to horror games and how you might be able to deal with it. But if you are concerned that you're suffering from an anxiety disorder or any mental health issues, then uh, remember that commercial games aren't designed as therapy and please do see a doctor. Uh, and it's amazing how time has flied. Uh, so I'm going to have to thank you both for joining me for this panel. I've certainly <laughs> learned a lot from you both, especially about horror games. So thank you both. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Sachin. And if you want to check out Gaming the Mind, uh, please go to 
gamingthemind.org or go to our Twitter, which is at gamingthemind. Uh, you can follow Hammy at uh, Hammy UK. Hammy underscore UK. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you want to. Uh, and if you have any questions for him, maybe. Anyway, so thank you for joining us as well. And um, I hope you enjoy your horror games and enjoy getting scared in a in a moderate manner. Safe way. Yes, in a controlled. Bye. Bye.